Well, Blowout was when I was mixing uh, Dress to Kill. I had this, uh, you know, sound designer named Dan Sable who had worked with such a movie. All right, so what do you think of uh, Blowout? I uh, I actually really liked it. Um, it's a younger John Travolta movie, so I really, I definitely got into that aspect of it. Uh, he's a good actor. I liked him. I liked yeah. the movie. It kept my attention. It was interesting, and it uh, they did a really good job of taking the what would you say the important moments and making them intense i've watched too many movies where it's been like this is our issue and then it's like just kidding it's not an issue anymore but this one like they faced the issues they struggled with them that's that's one of the best things about this movie is that you could see them struggling and trying and being frustrated instead of just being like oh these are our problems yeah and Here's the funny thing about it. I'll do a little introduction. Is you know back when YouTube was cool, <laughs> you know I used to edit a lot of videos and then I'd find something on YouTube to watch. And one night while I was thumbing through YouTube, I found this movie right, and so I watched it and I was like, "This is pretty good." And so a few years later down the road, I decided, you know what? What was the name of that movie with John Travolta and all this that I saw on YouTube? And I was able to find it. And usually when I watch a movie again the second time, I don't like it. But I watched it again the second time. I said, wow, this is really good. And I finally really got what Brian De Palma is doing in this film. Is like I watch old Hitchcock films. And as you watch these reviews, I talk about Hitchcock a lot, don't I? And so I refer to Alfred Hitchcock. And this film is very... Uh, what you would say kind of f- favors that Hitchcock style. And uh, you'll see some parts, and it's like some of the acting in it is like from that old 50s and 60s acting, you know, back in the old days. Uh, I really, like you said, I really like John Travolta. John Travolta in this actually had insomnia to kind of make his character more like uh, aggressive and a little bit more irritable. And it really worked because it really shows. And like I said, yeah, John Travolta is a great actor. And I think films like I don't like staying alive. I don't like workout and all these kind of films that he was in, but this kind of role he was really good at. And it really, to me, those other pop films, I guess you would say just kind of hurt him when he does a role like this, where he's really, really good and interesting, and you really like the character. I'm going to be honest. When I think John Travolta, I think Grease. Yeah, that that's true. That I And I'm not saying anything, you know, those films are pop, and they're fun, and everything like that, but it doesn't really give him his strength of acting like this right. film does. It, it really shows what type of actor he really is, and... Uh, it um give you a little basis i mean brian de palma you know came up with this idea there's a couple of reasons you know uh he came up the idea while he was making another movie he was mixing another movie and this film came to came to his idea about being a sound guy doing all this and there's a little homage to real thing life in cinema like uh, the name of the uh, place that he works for is basically lot like American International Pictures. It's a small studio that produces like really crappy slasher films and things like that. I like that part yeah. of this. I like that aspect of how he was involved in making movies. And throughout this entire movie, they like kept true to that scene. Like you'd see right. him go back to the office and dealing with the different scenarios like casting the scream girl it's like oh my god we'll get to that part later like i love the full circle it was just it was honestly wild yeah and i I was wondering when i got to the end again last night i was thinking i wonder if they thought about calling this film the scream because like i said it goes into this full circle about starting with the scream and ending with the scream and uh, the uh, Nancy Allen was a the former wife of Brian De Palma, which is the uh, director of this film. And a lot of people say I, I'm very critical about all these a lot of these directors because everybody in film school was like, "You got to this guy, and this guy's great, and this guy's great." And Brian De Palma is one of those guys. Oh, he's wonderful, and he's had a good relationship with George Lucas. And uh, when he was uh, casting Carrie, at the same time George Lucas was casting Star Wars, and they kind of combined the casting chair together now john travolta was in carrie as well 
And so was Nancy Allen was in Carrie as well. Oh, really? How did I miss that? Which one? I didn't know he was in Carrie. The original 1977 Carrie. Yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that. I've seen it, but it was a long time ago, so that's probably why. Yeah, I've never really fully seen Carrie. I'm not like one of these people like, oh, you got to see it, and it's great for I think that's the reason why I avoid movies like Carrie, because people's like, you got to see this, like the greatest film of all time. And so when people I tell me, strong. <laughs> it's like when people tell me that, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, I, I'll just take it what it is. Yeah, sure, it probably was a great film. Don't want to see it? No, because I've seen so many clips of it, I know what happened, okay? <laughs> that's the problem when you get a great film like that. It's like everybody knows what happened to Carrie. Why should I have to watch it? <laughs> 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 okay. There's plenty of people yeah, exactly. on the internet prepared to give you the entire lowdown of the movie. Exactly. It's like, okay, she gets drowned in pig's blood and kills everybody. I understand that part. <laughs> and, and this is the reason why I'm going to get a lot of hate comments. Brian DeFalm is a god. He's the greatest person of all time. How dare you think you even can compare? You should watch Curry. <laughs> all right. So, anyways. Regardless of that, enough film score nerd stuff. So, uh, yeah, I like this film because it's very Hitchcock in an order. And and the people say it's it there. I mean, he like, here's the thing about it. it. Like with that opening scene, let's just go ahead and I'm going to just drop into the film because. Uh, all right. So this opening scene is uh, you, you, and I know like you're probably scratching your head. I know when I watched it like the second time, I was like, am I watching the same movie <laughs> when I watched that beginning? <laughs> I don't remember this part. I, I'm looking on the internet going, I know I picked Blowout. I didn't know it was a horror film, you know? Yeah, I know. I started the movie and I was like, great. I'm so glad we're starting with another sex scene in this movie. <laughs> I, but it was the only one in the entire movie. It doesn't match up at all. So that's why I'm like, okay, uh, they just wanted that for the... To, for the views, yeah. <laughs> the views. Yeah, and 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 and, and I I want to say I want to say he's being a little critique at the uh, pop slasher, and I do too. I critique pop slasher. You guys don't get me wrong, because you you take there's certain films that were really really good slasher films, and then they just became pop like pop metal. Let's get into that. Same with pop metal. When you had heavy metal, oh yeah, heavy metal is real cool, and then you get pop metal with these guys. Just runt heavy metal, and it's like everybody didn't want anything to do with it, and that's, and that's the reason why people drove to uh, to uh, alternative because you know heavy metal became too pop, and it's the same thing with slasher films. It just got they got so poppy and cookie cutter and everything like that, and you know this is kind of a making fun of all those popular slasher films because these things are bringing in money. I mean, you could make them for like ten thousand dollars and then just like make a million off of them, and that's a lot of flipping money. Because I mean, these actors and actresses that were showing their were making maybe a hundred dollars to flash. And you can make them in New York or Philadelphia, which was like what this movie was based, or you can make them in Florida, whatever. It didn't matter. As long as you got distribution for them and then the guy going, what do you got there? It's a slasher film. All right, <laughs> let's get it. <laughs> and they just, you know, put it out there. And this film critiques that a little bit because you watch this, it's like boom, boom. Okay, it's got it's got nudity, it's got violence, it's got creepy stuff in it. So it's like immediately, you know, he's critiquing all that stuff to bring your attention and weird music. And then it opens up and we're into the real world, which is John Travolta's character is a Foley artist. Uh, he calls himself a sound guy. And uh, which is, I'll tell you, one of the dream jobs I would love to have. One thing when I was in engineering school was getting to do Foley work, which is really cool. Like you walk on gravel or you walk on sand to get the sand effect or you. would uh, uh, what's another thing we would do? Oh, you'd hit certain rocks or whatever. You you, you crunch celery to break someone's back. You you do all these needle effects. You slice into a watermelon. You know, if you're you're slicing somebody, uh, you take. A ping pong paddle, tie two meats to it, pop, pop, and you'd have your punching effects. So there was a lot of uh, Foley artists is one of the dream jobs I've always wanted, but it's kind of hard to get into LA and the Hollywood industry. I mean, and plus it's too saturated now. But back in the day, man, if I knew that there was a job where a guy could take two 
uh, paddles with meat tied to them and uh, make money, I would do it in RV because <laughs> I love making noises and I love recording noises. And this is like my dream job right here. But, you know, stuff like this is no big deal now because nowadays you can take libraries. I got libraries of sound effects. You go, you just drag and drop and it's all done. But one time this guy like this made those library of sound effects. So uh, get into this little bit character, John Travolta, and what he's doing here. Okay, so basically at the beginning of the movie, like you said, he's uh, out uh, collecting these sound effects. He's got his mic, and he's, you know, listening to the owl sounds and the creak and just, you know, it's like a really peaceful scene opening up where he's just collecting all of these sounds. And then all of a sudden, boom, you hear a gunshot, you hear a blowout, and then you see this car swerve off of the road and like off of this fence and into the ledge or into the river. And he's like, oh my gosh, I gotta go, I gotta go save whoever's in this car. So he literally, you know, throws down all of his sound equipment and just dives into the river um, straight down. And he, he sees the car and he sees that there's a woman trapped inside of the car. And then, uh, I, I know realistically, once there's a car, you know, in the water, you can't really break the windows like he did. But he did, because this is a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he drags the girl out of the car. And that is our opening scene, basically. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's an exciting scene. And uh, it, and at the time, he Brian De Palma was kind of reflecting real life. Uh, a lot of this is based on Ted Kennedy's incident. If y'all didn't know, Ted Kennedy was out with a girl one day, and uh, the girl died while he was driving, and there was still a big, um, you know, debate whether he was driving or she was driving and whatever. But anyway, the girl died. And then Ted Kennedy's like political career really ended right and then and there. So this is if you look at the sign there, it's a it's a takeoff of Chappaquiddick, which is Chappaquiddick, which is in Massachusetts where uh, Ted Kennedy lost the girl's life. And so this is a little based on that a little bit, a little bit of the Watergate's in there too. So it's a lot of things. It's one of the first uh, they call them conspiracy movies. Like, uh, there was a movie called uh, The Conversation and movies like that. So, and it's really neat how, and I, and I think with Brian De Palma right here, what he learned, you know, like Brian De Palma and all these guys like this were kind of what you would call getting, uh, there's a terminology where they call apolitical. It's kind of like being an atheist, except for you're like, uh, you're like an apolitical, like you don't believe in politics anymore. Like they felt like they got uh, let down by Republicans and Watergate. And now they feel like they got let down by Democrats with the Ted Kennedy scandal. So this is what kind of like what this is. And, and a lot of th the thing is nowadays, uh, you know, we, we got the internet and we kind of, bogged down the conspiracy stuff in there but this is becomes a really big thing in this political motivation because they try to silence uh poor john, uh, john travolta's character don't they yeah very much so and it was just it was a very frustrating scenario for sure yeah and that's what i think adds to wanting to see what what are they going to do next what are they going to do next because uh uh you know first thing they want them to forget about this girl uh, and I'll try to explain again why this is so uh, reminiscent, why you got to watch the movie to actually get it. The governor is uh, with this girl, right? And so this, uh, well, he's supposed to be one of the presidential candidates, right? So it becomes a really big thing because now, okay, we got to go to uh, John Travolta. Don't you got to think about the family? What's his family going to think? He's with this uh, gar girl and everything, and all right, this kind of thing. They're interrogating yeah. him, and basically, like while they're doing that, they're trying to like use weird interrogation tactics yeah. to like flip the story in his own mind. And he's like, "I'm not having none of this. I, I saw what I saw. I was literally there. I have right. it on tape." Like, yeah, and it's like. But you see uh, why I think that he's trying to sh show why you end up having these things because people, 
I mean, they say the road to hell is paid with good intentions. And so, like, these people, oh, you got to think about his family, and if they'll be hurt, and he's died, and what what would happen if you, do you want people to know that you were with this girl and not your wife, and all this kind of thing? And he kind of, like, you know, bought, buys into it a little bit. Uh, and then you got Nancy Allen's character, who we find out later is not as sweet as she seems. Uh, you know, Nancy Allen said the way she described the way she wanted to play her was like a rag doll, you know, basically. And so, uh, which is a great character. I, I, it, it may take a little while. A lot of people probably might have a little problem with her accent and, you know, that kind of thing. But she's an interesting character. So we introduce her. What she's like. What is she like? character we get to see because whenever we first meet her uh he's visiting her in the hospital room and she's like super disoriented and like falling yeah. all over the place and like she's like where's my purse i got i gotta leave um i don't like people observing me and she was just really like out of it so there wasn't a lot of like character development in like the first part there but as it goes along and he gets to know her a little bit more or he's trying to get to know her a little bit more, you can tell that she's, I don't know, she's very, I want to say easily manipulatable. Is that a word? Um, <laughs> You mean that she's manip- manipulating him or, oh, is she gullible? Is that what you're trying to say? That she's well, not gullible. She's She's easy to manipulate. She's easy to, like, use her as a pawn to, like, play into any kind of... She's a manipulator. She's a manipulator. Later. She's a manipulator. Manipulator. She's a manipulator. Yeah. (laughs) We've got got models like that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, like, like, anything, like, at one point, like, he's, she's about to leave on the train. People are paying her money to, like, go away for a while to, you know, get the story to go down. And he meets her at the train station and is like, oh, let's go get a drink. Just just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes and everything. Yeah. And he misses the train and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, you're just trying to make me miss my train. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like, girl, dude, like I could be like, yo, there's like $20 over here in this bathroom stall. There's totally not a killer in there. And she'd be like, oh, my God, $20. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, oh, that's what I'm saying. Are you, it sounds like she's gullible, what you're saying. But the thing is, I did <laughs> like a, it. Sound gullible. <laughs> yeah. The way I, I, I feel, this is one thing I'll say about, this is where I'll say John Travolta's acting will go. Because you can tell right here, he's not really, you know, in love with her right here. He's kind of mm. like just curious about her. But then she kind of breaks him down a little bit where he starts uh, sharing a part of his past. Like he opens up to her, which really, that's how you kind of fall in love when you start becoming very, uh, you know, uh, open with person where you become very vulnerable. So he becomes vulnerable with her and opens up about his past. And so that kind of opens up the, um, you know, the romantic aspect of it. Yeah, that was a very interesting scene too because I feel like it it he says he says at one point he's like, "Yeah, I used to work on uh exposing undercover or exposing corrupt cops." Is what he right. was saying like he was would expose people in higher positions that were corrupt and I'm I thought that that was a really interesting thing because the entire basis of this movie is corruption, you know, them yeah. trying to like cover up this story and all of that. So I found his past lining up with this was very, it was a good Yeah. Fit. Well, I think what happens with that, with that, you know, where he opens up about, you know, like I said, being part of the corruption, I think that gives us a little bit more motivation here because it, even if it was a fact, if it was because he was in love with her, that would be a, a motivation. But his motivation, because he's got that little cop mentality there and exposing corruption thing. And I think he's kind of became complacent, but, now that's kicked back in. It's like that going through his past going, man, I used to be a guy who wanted to expose corruption. What happened to that guy? And I think he, he got a little bit of push in that, and that that kind of motivates why he's pursuing this. Because he, And plus, when he, it adds the fact that, that a police officer 
uh, died while he was trying to expose corruption. I think it also adds uh, more to uh, motivation, too, because it says, I'm not going to let that happen again. Well, in the next few scenes, we get to see that someone releases. It's really weird. They said he had video footage, but he sold all of these video footage as pictures to a bunch of magazines. So it pops up that somebody else was on the scene. Somebody else has pictures of this. And he's like, oh, man, if I can get this original video and put it with my sound, people will be able to see that there was a gunshot before the blowout, which everyone's trying to say, oh, it was just a blowout. This is a freak accident. Like, you know, just trying to completely cover this up. And he's like, no, somebody shot out this tire for sure. And he's trying right. so hard to prove it. Yeah, and this is where we get John Lithgow's uh, The Dad from Third Rock from the Sun. <laughs> the Preacher from Footloose. <laughs> and later on, he uh, changes the tire so that uh, to prevent the corruption, you know, not the corruption, from the conspiracy to be uh, unraveled. And uh, this guy is really the thing that really makes life hard for John Travolta and all this. This would be a lot easier, but John Lithgow becomes this thorn in his side and just a really great character and just a great villain, I guess you would say. Right. And at this time, he's also setting up, like he's getting ready to kill Sally, basically, but he wants to make that also look like, not like an accident, but like a string of serial killer murders so that it doesn't look like she's involved. So he's basically hunting down these girls that look like her and killing them so that he can set up to kill her, which is like pretty mind blowing, honestly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an interesting thing. And it kind of reflects again at the time, like real life. Cause I think the son of Sam, when you know, all that stuff was going on, uh, he went after like brunettes or something like that. And so that's what he was trying to do is trying to make it look like a son of Sam uh, killing and Boston Strangler at the time was another one and things like that, which is uh, OK. It works, you know, because it's like, yeah, like you, because I'm like, why would he do that? But I could see because, again, that goes into conspiracy. Maybe these serial killers are set up by, you know, <laughs> you know, corrupt cops or something. Right. You know what I'm Super saying? The consp- and that was never yeah. even released in the movie. Like, literally at the end of the movie, they're like, oh, this serial killer, did blah, 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 blah. They were never, <laughs> they never really, like, tied together that this was, like, part of that. So it's really weird to sit and think about how many events – in history and undocumented are actually related, you know, it really makes you think. Yeah. And, and that's the whole thing. And I think it shows the sign of the times where, you know, at the beginning of the eighties, cause I lived through this time and I can tell you a lot of, here's a lot of things that was going on. That's the reason why the seventies and the eighties and the nineties and two thousands and 2020s are different is, I mean, it's like, this is a country that went to Vietnam. We were feeling the hurt of Vietnam. We had the Watergate scandal. We were feeling the hurt of Watergate scandal. Uh, We had the Ted Kennedy scandal. We felt the hurt of Ted Kennedy scandal. And so you had a lot of people going through what I call apolitical, meaning they just had gave up hope on their government. And they were like, and that's the reason why someone who grew up with Vietnam veterans, it's like, if you didn't grow up with Vietnam veterans surrounding you, you don't know what these guys were going through in their mind. It's just totally crazy. And that's the reason I get movies like Rambo and things like that. And like this is that film of that era is this oh this post Vietnam, post Watergate, post Kennedy scandal. It was like people just were you know, they were lost. They just said, you know what? Forget the government. Let's just work on ourselves. You know, it's like because uh, you know, the corruption, you know, we can't depend on the government to save us. Let's try to save ourselves. And so a lot of people started, you know, living out in cabins in the woods and stocking up and that kind of thing during this time. I mean, there were militias getting things left and right. And a lot of people think that it's all conservative right, but it's not. It's like you type people like Brian De Palma, they're left wing and Oliver Stone are left wing. And they're big conspiracy people. They look at the kid, the, uh, another one is the Zemuckas brothers or whatever. All these people think that there was a, you know, Kennedy conspiracy thing and they were left wing. And then you got the right wing people who think that the Watergate scandal might be conspiracy. But, you know, everybody has this conspiracy idea. And back in the early 80s, this stuff, 
this was really one of the last movies to kind of pull away from it until you get like conspiracy theory with Mel Gibson. But it's like all that stuff just makes this movie, which that is really minor because you can watch this movie and not think about the conspiracy theories and think about the love story here, or you can think about the uh, tragedy here. And I think that's another thing too, is when it gets down to it, you forget about the conspiracy theory. You think about these two people because he kind of eventually sees her, you know, more than just this, uh, pawn because let's get into this pawn because we get another character that's introduced here which is uh later on would go to new york nypd uh i cannot think of his name <laughs> oh my gosh uh he's the uh he looks like the char character from aqua teen hunger force if you guys are fans of that <laughs> You ever watch Aqua Teen Hunger Force with the fries and the shake? Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that completely <laughs> animated objects as people? Yeah, exactly. And that guy there who plays her, the photographer that sets up, uh, Nancy oh, Allen. Oh, nasty guy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I man, he was so cringy the entire <laughs> time. I was like, don't touch her. Please stop. <laughs> like, oh, man. And here's where I think, like, he's, like homaging like older films because he really makes this guy so stereotypical and my gosh I cannot think of his name uh I can just go to the cast and look at it um uh, Dennis Franz Dennis Franz plays a character he was from NYPD Blue and he just makes his character so nasty I I want to touch on this a little bit if go ahead because oh my just God. wash your hands afterwards <laughs> I, that, I'm gonna take a shower after this review honestly like ew <laughs> but like you said you had to bring guy, that up didn't you <laughs> they like they like really hit the nail on the head with making this guy's character all around nasty and sleazy and gross like from the way that he talks all the way down to like the costume they picked for him the shirt okay so the costume he was wearing was basically a wife beater soaked with like miscellaneous liquids and stains okay it was disgusting i noticed that first off i was like okay this guy's like costume oh disgusting <laughs> and then the way that he talks to sally okay each and every time she says literally anything she could be like oh i woke up this morning he'd be like oh yeah babe tell me about that why don't, why don't you tell me about that babe yeah why don't you tell me about tell me all about it and it's like i don't want to i want to run in the opposite direction as fast as possible okay mm -hmm. and if that's not bad enough there is a scene she is talking to him and he dead ass goes into the bathroom and just starts peeing with the door open <laughs> still talking to her i was losing it i was like this guy man oh my gosh i could not believe it it was crazy okay rant over there you go they did a good job of making this guy gross <laughs> yeah and 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 basically well you i'm gonna let you go ahead and talk what type of scam does nancy allen or ragdoll and uh, dennis franz got going on okay so basically they set this up to where she was supposed to meet the governor at a party and then they were going to go somewhere and get some pictures taken so that they basically got it paid a bunch of money to do this so that it would ruin his career. Right. But they're saying, you know, there this guy wasn't supposed to be killed. There wasn't ever supposed to be a gunshot. This was supposed to be easy money in and out, like exposing him as like, you know, being with a girl when he's got the family and everything basically to try and like get him out of this presidential race, um, which, by the way, apparently he told her that they made three grand and then he lets it slip that he made six grand and she was really upset. And like, once again, guy, there you go. Like well, won't even share his money with her. Yeah. Not, not getting into the canon about this guy, but I was thinking that, that he had, here's I'm thinking that he's either drunk at this time or he's like lost his mind. Like the guilt and conscience is at, at him so bad that he's just, he started uh, taking a lot of alcohol and pills to try to forget what's going on. So I think that's what's going on right now. And that's the reason why like, he slips up and says all these things. Because he's basically dead inside. Right. He's obviously extremely drunk. I mean, he's holding yeah. this like half-empty bottle the whole time, too. But I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, I didn't even think of it at the time. But, I mean, if you were involved in something like that and somebody dies, how would you not feel the guilt? 
Yeah. Then again, he did go back and sell all the photos. Well, so, that's what I'm saying. And I think I think that what happened is, you know, he saw all the photos and he's, and he, he's trying to succumb that guilt. And so he's like drinking everything. And by the way, all right, so, you know, going back to Hitchcock, I, the J&B alcohol there, that has got to be an Italian <laughs> reference to their movies because they always had the J&B liquor. Look it up. You guys, right now, uh, Google J&B liquor and Italian uh, films and you'll know what I'm talking about because in every Italian giallo film you have J&B liquor so I always wonder if this is a little homage to that or it's just the fact like in those other films that the, the J&B liquor paid them to do advertising but yeah uh, so this it brings into more and it also kind of destroys the innocence of Nancy Allen's character a little bit because she, she's not as mm -hmm. sweet and innocent as we thought Definitely. That was a big eye opener in this because, you know, the entire time you're thinking, oh, this poor girl, you know, she's a victim for this. And then you realize that, you know, one of the reasons this entire incident happened was because she agreed to do this, you know. Yeah. So it's like, hmm, how innocent is she really now? Not very innocent. I feel like that also plays into the part that she's easily manipulative, manipulatable. She's gone. So. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to figure out where we're at, and because we we've already skipped the Denzel. Um, okay, so basically, um, we go back to find out that all of Jack's tapes in his studio have been erased from all their sound. Someone took a magnet, erased all the footage yeah. that he has, but he did have a copy of the sound of the accident that he had hidden in his apartment. Um, at this point, he is approached by a uh, news station saying, hey, we want to hear this. We want, you know, if you can get the video and put it together, we will play this on air and people will believe you. We can, right. you know, out this. We can, you know, and everything. So at this point, that's when he sends Sally in to go meet with this sleazy guy to try and get the original film, which she ends up retrieving. And here we are. Yeah. And with the guy. Yeah, and that's the thing is, uh, she uses a bottle to uh, to <laughs> knock crack his head and, and knocks gets the uh, gets the ah, gets the film. This is John Travolta, and like you said, now the thing is, at first I was wondering why this news guy had this voice, but then I realized the importance of that because. Uh, John Lithgow, of course, impersonates the news guy because the news guys talk like this, and he's like, and then I understand the importance of that because, like, when he's listening in on her conversation, he's like, that's not the news guy because he doesn't have that fake news guy voice, you know? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> he goes, "Hi, I'm Trevor Donahue," or whatever his name is. It's like, <laughs> what's his name? He's like, uh, 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 yes, Don Hughes. I think it's Trevor Don. You know, he goes like, "Hi, I'm Donahue." Yeah, it was like. And I do the news at eleven. You know, he had that fake news voice and all that kind of thing, and and it's and then you get into uh, you know John Travolta, you know, wanting to do this uh, because he wants to expose it to the world. I mean, he comes really motivated to expose us, and he, and he's like, we're gonna, you know, he tries to motivate her, but it ends up being a weird thing because, like, I guess. Um, John Lithgow is so charming. He talks. He he. It, what he does, he actually messes with John Travolta's phone. So this uh, news guy and John Travolta can't. They can't uh, get together. So he says, well, "Let me go." Uh, let me. And so he talks to the girl, which is Nancy Allen. Nancy Allen, of course, she's like, uh, "Okay," like he said, she's. <laughs> Easily manipulated. Yeah, like, okay, I'll meet with you. I mean, and John Travolta's like, like, okay, well, I'm going to have you wear a wire so that you'll be safe. I'll be able yeah. to, you know, find out where you are and everything. So, and the thing I like about this scene is that, like, the entire time that she and the bad guy are wandering around the train, st the subway, basically, the train station, uh, she's like, Oh my gosh, this is such a terrible place. There could be such shady people. Look at that guy. He's so shady. And it's like, girl, oh my God. 
<laughs> yeah, you're expecting every time she says something, he's going to do something like that. You say, like he could have a knife put out, and then John Lithgow pulls out a knife and then throws it away and, <laughs> and turns around. Right. And it's like and he's like, don't don't turn around and, and look at me. Someone someone who's following us might know something something. She's like, oh okay. Then she's like, by the way, and it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of like scary movie two or scary movie three, like when they're talking about something, something's going on in the background or something. <laughs> Where they're sitting there going, yeah, he could have a, a rope and noose me. And he's like, oh. <laughs> Turns around and throws away the rope. Yeah. Like the part of that makes me think of Tom and Jerry with like the like exaggerated weapons and be like, oh, oh, nothing here. Exactly. But and it's like like I said, John Lithgow's voice is nothing like the news pay, news guy's voice. So I think they don't, you know, press upon it. But of course, like John Travolta figures out where she's at, so he's like driving this jeep scene. And this jeep scene reminds me of like Italian. It's got this Italian yellow type music going on, where and they're doing this great. Hey guys, let's talk about the filmmaking for a minute. <laughs> These great aerial shots of Philadelphia are wonderful. And you see his Jeep going through some of the Philadelphia architecture. It's just gorgeous. It's great shooting. And of course it ends with this terrible crash into the window, but um but anyways, he's 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 laid up because he's uh, crashed into a window. He's he's knocked down, and then he's next thing you know, we see him at the hospital. And then of course John Lithgow is still trying to lure her to die, <laughs> trying to get the tape going on. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, yeah. He like basically so there's this big parade going on that he has to like drive through and everything. And whenever he's finally conscious, he's like oh crap like leaves the ambulance which yeah. who's gonna let you leave an ambulance first of all i'm just saying but yeah i kind of justified I that with throat. the parade was going on that's 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 what i think makes this kind of a good movie because it's like all this stuff is going on and yeah they're gonna leave him alone because there's so much stuff gone people are getting drunk and rowdy and whatever it's like if you ever been to mardi gras <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. it's the well, same I mean, if you're gonna drive your car through a window i think you should probably be restrained at that point yeah exactly that that was that was something else and but yeah he's like got picking up the uh sound getting back to where you know and i wonder how long these batteries last but um he you know he picks up back to john lithgow's uh conversation with nancy allen's character like I said, it's a lot of homage to Hitchcock. Like I said, you know, a lot of this stuff reminds me. If you guys watch Hitchcock film, this is that big climax. You know, like that big thing where they're, you know, he always picked like a big location, and and that would be where the final scene would end. And that's the same way here because we got the parade instant going on, and everybody's screaming and yelling. And he's the only one can hear you because he's got this one earpiece. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they they had like she was end up being on top of a rooftop under all of the fireworks. So that alone is going to be hard to find, you yeah. know, because boom, 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 everything. Um, he finally like locates her, finds her and is making his way up to the rooftop. Yeah, and it's like slow motion and everything. And you're going to think, oh, everything's going to be fine. It's going to be okay and everything. And it's not, but... You know, he does uh, kill John Lithgow's character because the point is John Lithgow is making shapes of a bell into their stomach with a mm -hmm. ice pick. And so and it gives you enough time to say, yeah, by the time he gets up them stairs, the guy's still going to be making a bell emblem. And so, yeah, that's justifiable. I can justify that. But she's going to be dead. And, and apparently right. she does die. Spoilers alert. She dies. I must say though yeah. i must say well two things actually one thing yeah. i must say is like out of all the really good effects they had in this movie her throat slit was by far the worst and most unbelievable effect i've seen in a movie probably ever i was like <laughs> wow it looks like they literally took fake blood and just drew it it didn't look like a wound yeah. or anything yeah and like and i said then, i always felt like that more hitchcock type like i said it's kind of a homage to older films i mean the acting right. is and everything is like another if, thing i wanted to touch on about before she even goes in to you know meet this guy and everything earlier in the film we hear Ta john travolta say that like when he stopped being this cop stopped doing all this undercover work and everything it was because the 
the battery, the wiretap that he put on somebody was he was sweating so much that it started burning a hole in him. Yeah. And he told this to Sally at the beginning of the movie. And then he's like, by the way, I'm going to attach this battery to you. And she's like, great. <laughs> yeah. I, thank God for uh, lithium. <laughs> <laughs> It's, he was like so so down. And that's the reason why I say like she's easily manipulatable, you know, because she's like, oh, this thing that totally like ended up getting somebody else dead. Let's do it. Like, oh man. Oh, right, it, it's a, it's like I said, and then of course, you know, one of the best shots I like is the um, the fireworks in the background. He's holding her, and I love how they, you know, pan around it and that kind of thing. And that's where I love about filmmaking, where you do shots like that, where you feel the intensity and the, you know, the loneliness. And, of course, at the end, of course, like I said, we round it off with the scream. And the scream is, of course, her scream. And and, and I think the thing that goes through your mind, I can see someone who does filmmaking going, you know what? You know, what is the history of all these library of sounds? Like, how did they get these library of sounds? And I think it's a really great way to show what goes on is, uh, you know, behind the scenes or use your imagination a bit. And and like I said, this film does. It, it's a lot of homage to the 50s and the 60s films. It's a great homage to your conspiracy films of course like I said they were wrapping up this is probably one of the last conspiracy films before conspiracy theory and that there's really not any films during that time after that everybody was just kind of like had you know just want to get back to having fun with filmmaking i think that's the reason why everybody loves the 80s so much is it was just uh, about having fun because we had uh you know we had, we had done the whole political 70s films to death and you get into the 80s you got this is going on and this kind of wraps it up and it is a very homage to Hitchcock I love how he does it if you love Hitchcock films you'll love this film and uh, what what would you say about this I mean I mean like this was a film I said you know very rare to watch a film twice and like it again and this mm -hmm. one the third time I kind of see more of it because it kind of makes you laugh because it when you watch it the third time, because you see the how he like references Hitchcock, like the intro titles are so Hitchcock, you know, like the birds and all those films he did, and then you get into the acting is so very Hitchcock acting, like the fifties and sixties acting, because no one really acts like a lot of these characters now. It's just like you don't do that kind of acting, but you get it if you watch those 50s and 60s films you understand oh i know that acting because i used to grow up on those films i'd watch those films late at night you know those old films those noir films and there's a good new john travolta noir film you guys need to check out sometime that i've watched here recently and it has a bloated um uh can't think of the guy from the mummy <laughs> bless his heart <laughs> in it but uh but yeah, you know, this is, I like it. I enjoyed it. This is the third time I've seen it. And, uh, you know, I, I recommend seeing it, checking it out. This is one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite films. Uh, really? Yeah. This is uh, one of his, and he, he references a little bit to it. There's just... It, For an older movie, it definitely had good acting. I have to yeah. say that. Cause we've reviewed a few, a few of the little bit older films, and I think this is probably one of my favorite ones that we've gotten to do because the storyline was just so enticing. Like, yeah. I sat down and I watched it in, like, one full shot. Yeah, and I think one thing with this film is I think it got lost in the shuffle of lots of films because 80 or 81, when this film came out, you know, big budget films like Raiders of Lost Art was really big, uh, you know, and everybody was trying to do this fantasy films and Star Wars ripoffs and slasher films. So you had this little film like this is like no one really knew about it until like the Internet came about and people started watching it again. And they're like, wow, this is a pretty good little film and it's like i said i'm not really a big brian de palma film i'm not a, a person i'm not one of these who's the greatest director of all time what he does touch his gold you know i can watch this film and see stuff that nowadays 
he would have said, oh my gosh, what was I thinking when I made this, you know, because I did the same thing when I watched some of my videos, like, oh, what was I thinking, you know, I, oh, I know, I was younger then, and it was the 90s, that's what I was thinking, and he's same way, he's like, oh, I remember, it was the 80s, and that's the way I thought back in the 80s, you grow up as a filmmaker, and it's not like the perfect film, but it's just, it's interesting that a film of this kind of caliber can keep your attention, that's, that's what's impressive about it. Uh, all right, so let's do recommendations and we'll be done with this. Okay. So I would recommend this film if you're in for a good movie that's a little bit older, but it still will catch your eye. It keeps you entertained. It keeps you wanting to watch this movie. It keeps you wanting to get through it. I would also recommend this movie if you're into things that are more about the making of movies, because, especially back then. Because yeah. nowadays, you really don't use, you know, all the tape reels, the video reels, the sound reels and everything. So getting to see the process of all that was very interesting to someone like me who was born whenever movies were yeah. already on CD yeah. and stuff. And or and, VHS books, I guess, but you know. Exactly, and and I keep on saying this is that I hate your generation because you got so much <laughs> technology, you guys don't use it. It's like when I was a kid. It's so good. It's so, it was a craft back yeah, then. Yeah, exactly. You here here here's the bottom line is you really literally had to be trained to make movies in those days. You literally really had to mm. have something. It's like with me and music. Is like in my day is. I used three tape recorders, and people would do the same thing with VHS and switch them from left to right. If I had a video camera, it would have been different. But, you know, with me, you know, I switched from one tape recorder to the other, and then I put two tape recorders playing at a time to get this flange sound and all these sound effects I'd make. And that's how I started, and then I went into four track mixing board into an eight track mixing board. I became the only person in my block had an eight track mixing board. So they come over to my house and they do mixes and that kind of thing. And and again, you had a tape, and you had to know, and you had to uh, run wires. You had a telephone board, and you had to switch all the wires and all this kind of thing. And it was very hard to do. And now I'm sitting here with a mouse, and I go drag, drop, click, drag, drop, click, drag, drop, click. And now I said, well, let me do video. And the thing is, when I was a kid, if I had access to YouTube, when I used to make music, if I had access to Twitch and I had access to uh, Instagram when I was these kids' age, I'd be on there every day making music and whatever have you and whatever it is because a lot of it is about charisma more than it is about this. And it's like nowadays when you're age years old people are like you're desperate for attention <laughs> but if you're 17 years old you're a thriving artist who who's trying to you know make it big you know people are a little bit more su supportive of you and trying to get you that right direction and it's like uh and people don't understand that's the reason why i'm not downing schools when it comes to entertainment but the truth of the matter is if you want to make a good film Make it different from everybody else. Don't go to film school because you don't need to. You can, if you're not, here's my thing too. It's like, and you guys can pity on me. Yeah, when we went to United, when you went to University of Southern California back in the day, you, like Kiddo said, you had to learn a craft. Nowadays, all you need is a $700, $800 computer and you buy like software. That's all you got to do. Download the latest software and keep on making videos until you get it right. Keep on making videos until you get it right. That's that's what you are now, and I'm like saying, it. That's the reason I hate being where I'm at right now because I didn't have all this technology when I was a kid. If I was a kid, oh my gosh, I'd be on YouTube every day. I would probably be making lots and lots of money because, I I you know you're younger and you and you'd have all the support. But like when you get older, now you're like now you've got to get behind the scenes and you got these younger people who can do this for you, which is fine. And that's where it needs to be because it's like, but I, I I love the fact that the technology is better. But what they did is just amazing, and you guys have to see all the stuff that he did, uh, to get that effect. Because like when I was a kid, I don't when we had kindergarten films when I was a kid it was like kindergarten, the teacher would have to run the projector, all right, and she literally had a mono tape recorder, 
And then she'd have to play the mono tape recorder and the projector at the same time for us to see films when I was a kid. What? Yeah. And they were, and I remember those films when I was a kid because those those had effect on us. We talk about those films at our teacher because like you'd have a little bit of uh, schooling, and then they if they you got your schooling done early, then they would do a film, and then like I said, it was usually on Fridays, you know, and then you'd have like a projector, and then you had that model tape recorder, and she'd have to play them at the same time, and sometimes it'd be out of sync, and sometimes it wouldn't, you know, but <laughs> but that's why you had to do it because like. Watching a film was a big deal, and that was before everybody had VCRs. I mean, like, uh, I think it was about 1980 when people really started to get VCRs in their home, you know, and and it really changed the industry. Uh, it really did. It, it made movies less special, to a lot of people would say, but it also uh, dug up all these movies that no one ever saw, too. So it was a love and hate relationship with that. All right, guys, I want to thank you for joining us. This has been a great discussion, a great film. Uh, for the first time in a while, we've uh, actually not pooed on a film. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, isn't it? That's kind of sad. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, you guys have a wonderful day. Uh, we'll get together, kiddo and I, and we're probably going to discuss a little bit about business. And I'm out here, guys. Thanks a lot for watching. Who's your daddy?